ladies and gentlemen. How are we doing out there? Oh, hey, you guys. Oh, hey, what's up? Oh, hey, sup? Oh, hey. Hey, how are we doing? Decent? Decent? I'll take decent. Anyone else? If, how about this? If you're doing good, on the count of three, say yes. One, two, three. Yes. Fuck yeah. Okay, good. Um, so, the last night of Playgrounds Netherlands, did we have a good time? Yes. Yeah. Did, did y'all have a good time? Yes. All right. I, I had a wonderful time, too. Um, huge thank you to Mr. Spiridon. If y'all don't know, uh, hey, gents in the back, um, uh, just very, very politely, if um, this is a panel in here, there is a bar out in the front. If y'all want to gab, um, please, by all means, very politely, though, while we're in here, let's try to, let's try to focus, because otherwise it gets super dismal. Um, Huge thanks to Mr. Spiridon. Everyone in here know what Firestarter magazine is? Yeah. Right, indeed. Firestarter is the magazine of this community, and it is all off the hard work and effort of Mr. Spiridon, who has been so kind to put this great panel together for us tonight. Um, so huge thank you to you for all of the work that you do. <laughs> Woo! Oh, nice Pauline, nice Pauline. Um, and tonight we have a very fun panel. We are going to be talking about mental health, um, which is something that uh, I feel like is so rarely discussed in the uh, in this community. You know, every day we're talking about the hard work and the long hours, um, but we don't necessarily talk about how we take care of ourselves and how do we um, give back to ourselves and maintain a, a career rather than just a crunch. Um, so we have a terrific panelist group here. Um, to my left is Mr. Dinar Dubs. Uh, <laughs> Dinar is a local Netherlands artist. He also has worked on uh, Last of Us. He's a fantastic concept artist. He gave a great talk um, yesterday. If uh, I hope many of y'all saw that. Um, and sitting next to Dinar is Iris. Iris is, uh, also goes by Loki. She is the god of mischief, so beware. We've, we've done this panel before, she and I, and uh, she's, she's, uh, she's got all the fun stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, and next to Iris is Bastion. Um, and Bastion is an art director working at Walden Light Studios, also worked on Spider-Verse. Very happy to have you here today. Um, and to Bastion's right, we have Claire. And Claire is the editor-in-chief of Imagine FX magazine, which is pretty sweet for all of us to have a journalist here who can give us a totally different perspective. And then on the other side of Claire is Loesch. And obviously, y'all know who Loesch is, world-famous illustrator. Um, incredibly pleased to uh, get to have you on this panel here with us. Thank you for being here. <laughs> fucking right, fucking right. Um, and next to Loesch is Mr. Mike Hill. Um, Mike is a designer. He has worked on just about everything you've ever seen on the screen, um, <laughs> including Dune and Blade Runner. Um, uh huh. And um, uh, we're going to be talking about a whole bunch of fun stuff. So uh, without further ado, let's jump in. Um, and thank you all for being here, joining us, and your attention. Um, so Loki. Um, talking about mental health, can you talk a little bit about um, some of the ways that you approach your work and how do you um, take care of yourself in the, in the process to make sure that you don't burn out? That's a good question. Do you have time? Um, so I used to um, be a complete failure. I, I might still be, but you know, I fake it. Um, but just two years ago, um, I felt like I was a complete failure, and I actually my job didn't go anywhere. I didn't get jobs. I didn't, you know, I, f I, f I felt I was a failure, and um, something clicked, and I started doing my own thing, which resulted in Fairies of the Fault Lines. This is a really s quick recap, and uh, for me to keep myself in check and actually uh, take care of myself mentally. Is it's very important that everything I do is 100% me. So I take on jobs. I do lots of my own stuff. I do gallery stuff. I do gallery art uh, shows, whatever I like. And the reason I do it because I like it and I want it. And it's not for the money. It's nothing else. But I want to do it. And I think that's very important that it's fun to do. And that's the most important thing for me. There's fun in it. And um, that makes me enjoy every second of working, actually. 
So even if I'm working on a totally different thing, like um, on a magic card, it's totally different. I'm doing architecture or whatever, and I not I don't like architecture. It means perspective, dudes. This is hard. I mean, that's difficult, but I I seek myself in it, and I find my fun in that. And um, art should be fun. We have the best job in the world. So for me, that, that aspect, I need to find myself in it and have tons of fun. That's my main thing, I think. And that keeps me sane. Or sane-ish. Sane-ish. Sane <laughs> kind of. Cool. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much. Yeah. Well, and, and to that thought about keeping the fun in your work and making it something that you really like, um, Mike, you have uh, quite famously worked with NASA. Um, and uh, can you talk a little bit about how you have such varied interests and how do you maintain such progress in all of these different categories that you do while keeping passion in that? Um, yeah, so I recently started working with NASA uh, as a consultant. Um, the reason they hired me was because uh, they had seen some lectures I made on storytelling and they were really interested in how I was making a wouldn't say scientific but a fairly logical construction about how the mind works in relation to stories <clears throat> but in terms of why that subject seems to to attain to, to be interesting to people and why it interests me is that I I wouldn't say that I'm a creative person I don't consider myself creative I consider myself obsessive at problem solving um, and I think that that it, the emergent property of solving problems is that it tends to appear quite creative. Um, so for me, I've, I've found that I'm fairly obsessive and I don't, I wouldn't say, by the way, that by virtue of being on a panel talking about mental health that I've got any authority on mental health. <laughs> uh, I would say possibly the opposite. Maybe we're, some of us up here are interesting case studies and how not to do it, I don't know. Um, but I think, I think that just being obsessive about something will yield results, but as with all things that yield results, there'll be some suffering along the way. So I actually think that mental health is, or, or, or suffering through your own ambitions and not necessarily enjoying it all the time is, is a necessary stage of the sacrifice that's involved in becoming someone good enough to bring value to the world. So I, I don't necessarily think that mental health is, is a is a purely negative thing. I think it's evidence that you're really fucking pushing yourself. Um, obviously, that's not a de facto. That, that, that's not true across the board. But I think um, it's not always bad to be miserable. Sometimes that's useful. Can you talk a little bit about the, the suffering there that you're, that you're talking about in, in service of the mission? Yeah, I think, I think every person, artists, scientists, anyone that, stri that strives to become good at something, they. Part of it is because they love it, and part of it is because they're running from something. So you want to be good at something because it's also great for your sense of, of personal value to, to be valuable at something. Um, and I think that there's two sides to the, to the coin, which is that um, the pursuit of, of excellence in anything, and I think I'm wandering off, off track here, but I think the pursuit of excellence in anything, whether it be art or whether it be... Um, being an amazing scientist is partly because you, you're, you're enamored with the subject to some degree, but also partly because some level of neuroticism drives you towards pushing yourself. Um, there's like the, in, if we're on mental health, like the, the most kind of pragmatic system of measuring mental, uh, the mental structure of people is the big five traits, which is um, summarized as ocean, which is openness to experience, uh, conscientiousness, uh, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And generally speaking, artists are, low, uh, are high in agreeableness um, and high in neuroticism um, and high in openness to experience. Openness to experience doesn't mean that you want to jump out of a plane with a, and assemble your own parachute on the way down. <laughs> it, means, it means your ability to play with unconventional ideas. Um, so if you're high in openness to experience and high in neuroticism, you're generally going to create something that other people find valuable. You're also probably going to be really fucking miserable. So it's like it's the it's the necessary burden that some people carry in order to bring value to the world. I don't think anyone who's truly happy ever really creates anything of value. Like I, I gen, genuinely, I think that there are some people that really are happy in the moment. But if you look at any of the people that we celebrate as the best artists or musicians, they weren't they weren't having a hokey dokey lifestyle. You know, like uh, I think they struggled a little bit. Yeah.
So yeah, yay, aren't we all happy? Sorry, yeah. bring, bring the room down. So just, as we're on mental health, I'll just have another slurp of this alcoholic beverage. <laughs> it's a mental health, man. Uh, Loesch, taking, uh, taking a look at your expression, do you, um, do you believe, or do, do, do you agree with that? Is, that? is that in your experience too? What Mike was just saying. Uh, well, I think there's some degree of like, when you pursue a passion, uh, and you really like drive yourself towards something, uh, you, you know, trying to improve at something because it's something you feel passionate about, then you will have to face challenges. You'll have to overcome those challenges, maybe move past your comfort zone, go it into the uncomfortable realm to improve at what you do. But I do think that if you're talking about the great artists, um, if you're looking at like the archetype of the successful artist, you know, there's a lot of like, uh, for example, uh, you know, throughout time, I don't know if you've ever read the essay, uh, Why Are There No Great Women Artists? It addresses the fact that, uh, it addresses the fact that a lot of the sort of beliefs that we have about genius and about great artists are shaped by, you know, societies that have always like, cult, like pushed certain types of geniuses to greatness because they receive resources that they need. Uh, and because they've always been sort of like given these resources uh, celebrated in society in a, in a certain way because they fit a certain category, then they reach this level that we consider geniuses. And these are tortured souls who, uh, maybe someone like Van Gogh who cut off his ear, you know, these kind of, they fit our image. But I actually think that now that like, there's more opportunities for different groups of people and women, for example, like here at Playgrounds, I've seen a lot of female speakers compared to previous years. There's much more of an open discussion about how much, how important support and uh, like support from the art community and like a good work-life balance and like discussions about the space that people get, need in order to be creative, the resources that they need. I think that that image is changing, you know, of what is needed to be successful. And I think it doesn't, it's not really, I think it's too simple to say that you, in some, you can't be happy to create something, mm. like, or that the great creators have never been totally happy people. Oh, no, sorry, but if I can clarify. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying that you have to be miserable to be creative. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is that some element of uh, a desire to pursue the, the, the discomfort of going into a zone you don't know is a prerequisite to being creative. And that means that you actually have to be uncomfortable at some point. Because if you're comfortable, you're not creating, you're just, you're running on a routine. So, so to clarify, I think happiness is possible. Uh, yeah. I think that's really important to clarify because uh, for me, I think that there's like a sort of problematic history of believing that suffering is really essential to art. And I see in my environment that a lot of artists believe that this suffering, this constant pushing of yourself, pushing to your limits, uh, is, is a part of the creative process. And then I see people burn out. I see people have injuries. I see people uh, take on like very unhealthy coping mechanisms to improve their art. And, and I do believe that if you cycle very wisely between a comfort zone and outside that comfort zone, but you're okay to go back into that comfort zone, I think that's necessary for longevity. Otherwise, there's always a chance you could burn out. Um, talking about burnout, Bastian, um, you lead it. Well, no, 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 no. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> no, you, you, lead a you lead a team, which I, I, th I believe, you know, Claire also leads a team, and I, I believe that that I'm, I'm very interested in the difference of managing burnout within yourself, mm -hmm. but then also managing burnout within your team, where you have younger artists whom don't have the experience that you have, and you have to manage their process along the way as well as managing your own. Do you find the dichotomy between managing yourself as well as a group of people underneath you to be something you spend a lot of time thinking about? Well, hopefully uh, in my team I was the only one to, to have a burnout, so yeah, I, I'm... I'm trying uh, really much to, to, to work with uh, happy people around me because, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I never had to manage uh, people with really strong issues because, uh, I don't know, maybe it's part of, of, I mean, I have a very young experience as leading people. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just starting. And um, for now, I feel really blessed that everyone is 
quickly, okay. But yeah, I had to uh, to fix some problem in my life, like some very strong problems. Uh, especially, it was in 2012, I guess. I had this this problem with five clients in the same time. You know, we we all do that at one point. And the deadline for every one of them was in the, was in the same time because, as you, as, as some of you saw today, I'm really good with planning. <coughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry by the way. And um, yeah, so I had to deal with that, and suddenly I started to yeah to not be able to to sh to swallow anymore. Mm. Yeah, I was getting like sick and sick and sick, and my yeah my happiness started to 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 fell down like just crazy and. Uh, I had to to do this work with myself, like okay, there is something wrong. Uh, maybe I'm I'm. Sick. I was sure that during dur during my sleep I would die from an asteroid coming in my room. I was sure about that. <laughs> Fuck. And yeah, the next day my wife said, okay, you just had to to go to the doctor. She she already knows what I was going through and. She was sure that uh, of the results, so I go to the doctor, and he said, "Yeah, yeah, sorry, dude, you are, you are perfect. Everything is in your head." <laughs> Shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the the thing I did was okay. I was just asking myself first. Okay, the the first pers person around around me uh, is she toxic for me for my happiness? Uh, it was my wife. So okay, she she breaks my balls sometimes, but. But it's great. It's okay. I love that. <laughs> so no, it's not. It's not from her. Definitely, she saved my life, actually. And um, okay, then next, my family. Oh shit. Oh crap. Okay, my brother. Okay, she's she's annoying, but it's okay. My mother. Oh. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I have to call her one day. I say, okay, if you want me to call you every day, I'm gonna just never call you again. She was crying and stuff. It was really hard for me, but I was like, I'm fucking okay. So it's not because I'm not calling you that I'm dead or I'm not loving you. You know, you know what I mean? Mother. And she was like, wow, she was, she was really destroyed. But I needed to do that because in my life, I, I felt so un under so much pressure from my family. And okay, some other guys in my family I had to just almost kill them. And <clears throat> it was so good for me. It was really tough. It was like a storm, but yeah, I just made it through the storm. And um, okay, next circle, the friends. Oh shit, not again. And yeah, you always have those friends like, hey, how are you, dude? Oh, very bad. Oh, again. <laughs> and it's going, going. You give them all the solutions and stuff, but they are like, no, yeah, <laughs> okay. You want to jump from the cliff? Go for it, dude. <laughs> Please. And uh, yeah, so I started to not see any more uh, very sad people around me. So and then finally, yeah, I just told to my clients. I mean, the last line in my <laughs> surroundings. Um, okay, guys, I'm sorry, I cannot handle this deadline. Is it a problem? Uh, two of them said, "Ah, oh, yeah, it's gonna be difficult." Okay, okay, uh, but if I'm dying right now, you're never gonna have the image. So if I am dead, yeah. <laughs> So, <laughs> I'm gonna need two days. Oh, okay. Huh. And the other one were like, okay, no problem, totally, of course, of course, we've all been there. Oh, yeah, that's great. <laughs> so, yeah, that's how I, I saved my life from, uh, from this burnout. And, uh, yeah, right now I feel lucky to have uh, happy people around me, or people with problems, of course, but um, there are always great people who can really handle their lives, uh, and it's cool between friends who give them some courage and some tips, uh, again, with my own experience, but yeah, for now, everything's fine, I hope, and I'm really working hard in order to keep my happiness like very high. Mm -hmm. this, this is why I create, just, just to stay happy, because as you said, it's important to, to, to be happy in this, uh, in, the, yeah, in this industry with your art, and it's because you are happy that, I mean, for me, that you're creating great art. Yeah, so, totally. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. One, one thought, because you, you uh, touched upon something that's really, really important, and it's actually setting your boundaries and telling that, you know, I can't do this anymore. I can't take this, I need time. And we're, as artists, we're always having this, uh, I see a lot of people having a fear of missing out. I had a lot of students come up to me to, uh, yesterday and today, 
And I feel so much fear of missing out on, if they don't say yes to this, uh, that might be, uh, they might lose a potential client. If they don't post every day on social media, they might lose a potential client. There's so much fear of missing out. And um, it's okay to take care of yourself and say, no, I don't want to do this. And I just want to go and game for a day. It's okay to go out and, and walk. It's okay to say, no, this is what I need now. Because what's going to happen? You're going to take that moment, that time for yourself. And you go back to your artwork <coughs> and be more creative and be more productive in those eight hours of work than you would be working 48 hours in a stretch. Um, so yeah, this is so important just to set your boundaries, be clear, be like, hey, you know, you've, you've set me this deadline. I had the same happen just a couple, like a week ago when I uh, got my a new assi assignment. Um, I would be traveling, I couldn't handle it. I had would have had two days to finish a complete original, uh, traditional for magic. I was like, oh shit, I need to tell them I can't do this, but will I never be asked again? And I'm like, you know what? If they think that's not good, if I say, like, I can't do this, I can't deliver the quality I want to deliver, and they say, nah, we'll work with somebody else, then work with somebody else. Because I don't want to work like that. I want to create art that's 100% something I can live with and uh, deliver the best work I can, and I need time for that. And if you're reasonable, open communication, setting boundaries, be clear, and, you know, good for you. Yeah. Good for you, really. We can add. Yeah, right now, what, what we do at the studio is that right now we, we, we try to, to keep safe all our weekends. I mean, we don't work during the weekends. If there is any clients who come back, okay, uh, on Friday, Friday, saying, like, okay, I need something for Monday, then, okay, but you you're going to pay my next motorcycle. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and it's going to be a fancy one. Yeah. And so it's, it never happened. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I think those are, are two such huge points, yeah. to, to set clear boundaries in, in your communication, and then to also consider the people who are in your life, because who we become is a direct result of the expectations of our peer group. And so if your close friends are bringing you down, you have to address that, and that can be a super painful thing to do. Claire, with, with a team like yours, do you guys, are you very um, deliberate about the kind of culture that you have and the way that you guys set deadlines and how do you set expectations for, for your team? Okay, um, yes, yeah, so I am very deliberate in how I do that because um, how, how I was managed when I was junior was you are in a culture of uh, you work all the hours God sends. Uh, you, you were talking about um, uh, like how uh, people have a struggle and in, in my company the struggle was you are always on you're always available everyone works late no one goes home you can't ask for time off nobody um nobody took all their holidays they were supposed to have um we were in the office from nine in the morning till midnight and i couldn't go home because my boss wasn't going home so it was, it was really hard for me to step away from that but then when i became manager i of course tried to change that we you have to go home you have to have something else you have to have another focus if you work till midnight you are not doing your best work if you if all you do is your job you are not being yourself you are being a machine um so i make my team take breaks i make my team take their holiday i mean i know it sounds it's all very admin based but it's really important to me that they take time away and then they come back refreshed otherwise they burn out I, I did. I, I burned out, so that's why. That's how I learned. Are you very specific about the types of scheduling and deliverables? So we we have strict deadlines anyway. So we just I so I, I commission all the content. So I I make sure that what uh, that I do my job, so they can do their job. I'm very respectful that they have jobs to do and deadlines to meet themselves. So I'm not going to uh, bring things in late or whatever or, or be sloppy myself because then that will impact on my team and they will also work very late. So I don't want that to happen. Right. So it's so, so important to, to make sure that the expectations are set and then that those expectations don't change. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Um, Dinar, you're at a really important chapter of your life where you've, you've now broken in and you found a, a quite a bit of success and you're looking for what's the next step. And I'm sure along that way is a ton of work. 
right? There's, there's the work in the office and then there's the portfolio work to take you to the next level. Can you talk a little bit about how do you manage the job, the, the personal work, and then have a, have a life? How do you manage to take care of yourself in the, in the process of that? So for me, um, so I, I work as a freelancer, of course. So I figure that at the end, like I've been, I've been doing for like 100 images, I think above 100 for like Last of Us. So I feel like with that sense, I already proved myself. So I'm actually every two months, I take like a week and a half or two weeks off just so I can focus on myself and actually do a personal stuff. Because at the end of the day is like when you do a personal stuff, it's you are directing yourself and you can show exactly how good you are, not to the people, but to yourself as well. And how I look at competition is, I used to look up like the great artists, you know, like it's one of my favorites is here, Mike Hill. And, you know, I feel like that if you, if you always compare yourself to the best, which is also healthy, you will always break yourself down because you always feel like you're less. So what I'm trying to do right now is compare, like having a competition with myself, with my older self as well. So I look up, look back to f five to six months ago and feel like, am I, do I have the same thinking or the mentality as five months ago. If I feel like I've grown, not just as an artist, because I don't feel like an artist, I'm not the artist, Donar, I'm actually Donar doing art. So I don't let that just define me, you know? That's my, I feel like art is the platform I choose to express myself, just like how, uh, how any art, like how a musician, you know, how a, an actor expresses itself. I, I look at it like that. And I think that what's super important is that knowing that you know you can't fight you, you can win every battle at the end of the day it's not about winning the battle it's about winning the war so sometimes you lose and that would lose i mean like you have days where it doesn't go well but i always think at that day that when the days come that it does go well it would feel so much more satisfying so it's almost like accepting i'm i'm i'm, act I'm actually trying to enjoy my dip days you know, because I do get depressed, uh, depressed and I'm super emotional as well. And, you know, I, I think what, what's also a healthy thing is like having friends around you where you can show your weaknesses and they can actually tell you, like, dude, work on this. Because I feel like if, if I'd much rather have my close friends tell me that, which I can learn from, than let's say if I'm at a business meeting or something and like I'm too loud or I say something stupid, you know, and it affects my career. So I'm always open for, for, for feedback for me as a person. And I'm always trying to, you know, I think it's super important to, to know that we are all, you know, I think as an artist as well, we're all super emotional. And I think as long as you, as, as soon as you embrace that, you're actually the winner at the end because nobody, if somebody tells me, for, I know that I, I talk a lot. That's my, that's my thing, you know, I, I, I ramble a lot. But right now, if somebody tells me that, I'm like, yeah, I know. And I'm sorry, but yeah, I, do, I still do it. You know, like, I try to work on it. And as soon as you actually say that, like, you, you confirm that, you know, I'm working on it, the other person will have an understanding for you. Like, oh, at least he's trying to work on it. I, I, I'm trying to, and, and I'm saying this not with the idea of, you know, I'm perfecting it. No, far from that. You know, I still have days where I feel like, I feel like shit. And... And I think that's, that's, you can't expect a professional here on this stage to be always perfect. I think, I think once you are as a, an, an artist, and I think this stage is super hard for us, is once you become, once you go into the industry, and you know, like when I went to The Last of Us, I was like, you know, I, I was like, that's the top, right? Like I'm finally there and there's probably somebody, you know, welcoming me into the, into the realm of artists. Like, welcome, you did it, you know? Now you can finally rest. That's not the case, no, because there's another mountain I have to climb, and then I'm on that top, and then there's another one. So accepting that you'll never be satisfied, I think that's where you, where you, where you start to grow, and, and, and accepting yourself as well. You know, everybody has faults. You can't be perfect. Perfection doesn't exist. No. Perfection doesn't exist, and, and learning is the most important thing. And it's so much fun. It's so much fun.
just you know there's there's new things to discover new things to experiment with so the artist i am now is not the same artist i will be in two months so i'm so excited about all the things i'm that are ahead of me that i have no knowledge about and that makes it so much fun and it makes it so much easier to accept that perfection you know that's not even that doesn't exist never nowhere right. and if you know, perfect, perfect people are kind of boring. You know, it's like, yeah, no. Yeah, I, so many, so many awesome points there, and I think that I love this idea that Dinar brought up of comparing yourself to who you were before, and I, I think there's such a, a conversation, especially in young people, to to want to be good. You know, yet good is something that the headline said about the work you did yesterday, yeah. and the goal would be to be better than you were yesterday every day. And I hope that we can all continue to grow. Losh, when, you know, at, at the position that you're in, how do you find the ability to continue to grow? What, what continues to motivate you and get you up every day and say, hey, I want to be better? That, that really varies. I get, like some days, my motivation is just I was hired to do a job and I'm just going to do it because I want to get paid. <laughs> It's not that beautiful of a motivation, but I mean, that is life. Um, I, for me, what really helps, and I think that's what Iris was saying as well, is that like, if you are doing what you, if you're connecting with your passion and your own strengths, uh, for me, it was a big thing to kind of discover what my own personal strength is. And that's a very difficult process for anyone, I think, especially artists, because artists are their own worst critics. So they will, they're will they very good at pointing out their flaws, what they need to improve on. Um, they don't tend to see themselves as business people. They don't want to project themselves as very confident. So it's very difficult to get artists to reach a point where they're like, well, my strength is I'm a very good storyteller. Like, you won't hear people really saying that about themselves very often. But I think if you know what your strength is um, and you play into it, so you accept it, you own it, and you start to build on that, then you, you can grow in a way, for me, in a way that I never thought I could. So uh, for me, being on social media really helped me to learn a lot about how people interpret my work and interpret my online presence. And when I was first sharing my work, I just thought, I'm just sharing something that I drew, you know, that. The title of my first drawing that ever became popular on DeviantArt was called, it was called Yar Matey because I had just watched Pirates of the Caribbean. So I had no idea, like I didn't think it had any meaning. Um, and then it like kind of took off and I was sort of what, like observing what, what is this, you know, why are people connecting to this and why do they want to see more because I'm definitely not the most skilled artist around. And I noticed that people want to learn from me. So they were like, how do you do that? What's your technique? Uh, and later on, as I became more active on social media, how do you do that on social media? You know, they asked a lot of questions wanting to learn. And I started to realize that maybe one of my strengths is that I, uh, I pro project myself and my work in a way that makes people feel safe to ask questions and to learn. And then I started building on that. So I started doing more tutorials. I started, uh, I, I released books with a lot of background information. I started doing workshops. And now my whole career has evolved in a direction that I never even thought it would. I started doing public speaking, which is my main fear. I'm, I'm still terrified to go on stage, but it's so, so worth it because, uh, because it connects with the strength that I have that I didn't know that I had. So for me, one of my big motivators is to keep building on these strengths and discovering more about what I'm capable of. But I think that only really works when you find something that makes sense, that like connects with your essence or your, your passion. And that's something, it's like a whole path, it's a whole dis journey just to discover what that is. Because you need to have meaningful conversations with people. And you need to get information from the right people to see what that is for you personally. Um, so that's that's one of my main motivators and for me i really need to calibrate myself based on the feedback that i'm getting which is why social media has been incredibly helpful for me because it helps me to kind of understand how is it resonating what is it doing with people and i don't feel like alone and kind of in a weird echo chamber of my own thoughts so, yeah. i love this theme that we're consistently building here that 
life is about chapters and your career is about chapters. It's not about a finish line, but it's about how do you reach a mountaintop and then find a new one and, and go on that journey. And you, you spoke so eloquently about self-awareness. Um, and Mike, I know that uh, um, there's a topic here that, that has sparked your interest about how do we understand our personality types. Um, and it's the Enneagram, I believe. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about that and some of your discoveries within it? Oh God, I can, but you're gonna have to stop me because I'm gonna rant for about like, it's just gonna go. Um, okay. <laughs> so I've been, I've been fascinated by psychology for a long time, um, partly because I had a, like everyone does, to some degree, a dysfunctional family. Um, <laughs> We all do have a dysfunctional family because, uh, yeah, that's just the nature of families. But um, I got interested in psychology and I was reading it for years, like for about a decade from 20 onwards, I was just pretty obsessed. And then when I moved, I went to L.A. to visit um, Tim Miller to talk about helping out with Love, Death and Robots. And David Fincher was the executive producer. And then I was introduced to this system called the Enneagram, which Fincher is obsessed with. And the Enneagram is a system that divides people down into nine basic types. And the types are based upon the fact that we either think primarily in our head, in our heart, or in our gut. And I don't mean that in some hokey way. I mean that very much uh, neurologically. We do actually have neural systems in all those parts. Now, the gut deals with anger. The heart deals with shame. And the head deals with, with thinking, uh, which deals with fear, which is anxiety. And the area that you spend most of your neurological time in is, is the area that your, your ego spends trying to defend itself, uh, trying to defend. So. If at a young age you were, you were de developed in a family where you developed a sense of shame, then you're going you're gonna to develop a personality type that protects you from shame. And when I say protect, I mean protect yourself from the realization that you're ashamed, as well as defend yourself from letting anyone else know you're ashamed. So you're kind of tricking yourself all the time if you're in that particular triad. If you're in the triad of fear, you do the same thing. If you're in the triad of anger, you do the same thing. You, you're trying to channel an emotion that you don't have full control of. So. The nine types, I won't take you through all of them, but what I, what I found out was a really elegant system of understanding what drives your personality. And the driving force of personality isn't positive. It's actually a defensive mechanism. Your ego and your personality is a way to, it's called character armor. It's a way to defend yourself against where you're most vulnerable. And it's not, this isn't a negative thing, it's just a reality that, that we tend to act in such a way that defends us from feeling the emotions that most affect us. So we've actually, and Fincher uses this system for a very specific reason. He actually makes his actors and actresses and his team take the test before he'll even audition them. For the simple reason that if you're the same type as the character, you're not acting. You're going to bring your life experience with you. Um, to give you an example, uh, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, I'm, I guess you guys have seen that movie. Uh, Lisbeth Salander is this extremely introverted, exceptionally skilled programmer that hides herself from the world and is completely antisocial. She's what's known as a type five with a four wing. Um, Rooney Mara is exactly the same type. And the reason that he cast Rooney Mara is because somebody who has that same typology brings with them an entire physiology that, that is derived from, from an entire life of acting in a certain way in normal life. So. If you're somebody that's a five with a four wing, you have a mix of fear and shame. You have a, a feeling of shame that society doesn't quite understand you, so you become completely introverted and you move away from society, you withdraw. And at the same time, you want to understand how to control the world around you that you find so threatening because you're afraid, which means you master something like programming or physics or science or mathematics or art. So the five with a four wing is somebody that's derived by fear and shame, and that's what makes them so capable at what they do is they derive their value from reacting to their fear and defending against it. And that goes back to what I was saying originally, is that actually all of our strengths are derived from our weaknesses. So I guess what I'm getting at is that what the Enneagram has taught me, and I've studied it pretty intensely, and I'm going to be talking about it in Canada tomorrow, or the day after tomorrow, is, is that our personalities and our skills are derived from some form of emotional suffering. And the best and worst aspects of us come from that. So. I, I guess what I'm saying is don't necessarily neglect the fact that what makes you suffer is also what makes you strong. Um, so don't, don't lose sight of that. Don't run from suffering and don't try and find a, a quick fire solution either because 
in reality, suffering is, is, a, is a really good training process, and everyone that's achieved anything of value has gone through it to some degree. Um, and I would recommend anyone who's interested in this as a system just to go and check out the Enneagram. It looks like a fucking cult, I swear to God. It looks like a Scientology symbol. Um, when, when I was first told, like, to, to look into this, I was like, I looked at it, I thought Fincher was playing a prank. I was like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. This thing looks, it, it literally looks like a pentagram. Um, but it's one of the most elegant, elegant uh, systems of psychology I've ever read, and I've been reading up on quite a lot of them for quite a long time. You will learn a lot about yourself, and I already know the distribution of most of the people in this room because artists are generally type fours, which is that artists express themselves using their art because at a young age they were generally made to feel uncomfortable with expressing themselves in the family environment. That's just, that's just a feature. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm not making out anyone to be robots. What I'm saying is that it's human. It's human. It's a human reaction to a young experience. Um, so, and you'll learn a lot of empathy from the Enneagram. It doesn't systemize people to become robots. It systemizes them so that you can understand where they come from. And you'll immediately understand your own habits and un you'll understand your own reactions to things as well as understanding where other people are coming from, including the people you really disagree with. You'll suddenly go, oh, fuck, that person does that because of this life experience at a young age. Um, is that, I'll, I'll wrap up there, because I think, yeah, okay. Um, thank you for sharing that, I think, um, yeah. There's something, there's something so eloquent about, about the idea of, of our strengths coming from our weaknesses, that it is our shadow side and the, the toughest parts of life that truly define us. I find that over and over and over again, it's the conversations I don't wanna have that actually make the relationship so much better. In a, um, goddess of mischief. Do you uh, do you find do you find that do you find that that in in your relationships or in your in your work that it is the shadow side of things that often can bring the light and or it is it is the 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 balancing of 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 binaries. I do think so. Yeah, in, in to certain extent, um, I actually say in my bio that I try to find the. Like I, I try to explore the darkness to find the light, and I personally feel that darkness is not darkness. There's always light there, even how bad a situation is. There is inspiration there, and um, for me personally, um, as artist or me in like I, I can only talk about myself in this case. Is I am completely open. I, I need to experience everything very intensely. And it's scary and it's, it, it sucks and it hurts and sometimes you get like, completely obliterated. And yes, I too have had a burnout. Um, I, I had uh, lots of experiences with death and, and loss and feeling alone, completely alone. But in that, those moments, I had to be my own best friend and find ways to you know, for me it was a way to, like, I want to give people hope and myself hope with the art I create. Um, so I think that there's, there's something positive. It, it, maybe that's also a character trait or whatever you call it. Um, I don't get discouraged by the darkness. I embrace it and I wait for the moment and you'll see light. And any room can be as dark as it is, or any life moment can be as so dark. But if you wait and let your eyes adjust, you'll see stuff. And that's with experiences like I lost my dad to cancer, all those things. I had to go through it. And now, years later, I can look back at that relationship and that moment of him. His last moments was euthanasia. And I was, I knew five minutes later or half an hour later, he would be dead. I knew that moment. So you're so focused on those final seconds. And it was tough, it was, it was hell. I cried months later, to burn out everything. But now, I've, that's the most amazing part. Because I had that, I had the experience. I had that very intense moment. And there's, there's, many of those situations in life that you go through that are very intense and you have to go through them and you look back when you've, you've done it and you're like, shit, I did it, I'm still here. 
and I'm stronger. And with that experience, I can help other people. And whether it's by art, by talking about it, being open about it, again, communication, being open, there's no shame. We all go through it. You never know what, you know. I know now you have a mum like I do. I mean, <laughs> I feel you. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. yeah. So for me, that's, um, I can't create art without the darkness, but I am managing the darkness and I'm the mistress of the darkness. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Such a wonderful phrasing of if you wait till your eyes can adjust. I love that. And speaking of, of moms, the, the line that I, I, always, I always quote my mom on is that, is that she taught me to see the light in the dark. And I think that's, it's so, so true that, that from those, those tough times, you know, from of all of our darkest efforts are where the real greatness comes from or the greatest moments of our lives will come from. This, the sky can be so dark, and if you s just stay looking at the sky for just a couple moments longer, there will be stars. You know, it just takes a time. It takes takes a while to get adjusted. Yeah. So, it's, uh, you know, that's my wise words of wisdom. <laughs> um, question for for all of y'all. Um, I think it's it's something that that's really good to hear um, from artists at, at y'all's level. Um, or people at, at a career of, of, of y'all's level. Do you guys ever suffer from imposter syndrome? Do you ever? Yeah. Shit. You have to say I mean, well, isn't, isn't, that, isn't that incredible? Every single one is immediately like, of course. You know, you're talking about world-class artists, and I feel like, does, do, would any of y'all like to share just a, a little bit of what your experience is like with that? <coughs> yeah, every day. <laughs> You know, everybody's like, oh, you worked on Last of Us. Well, yeah, man, it's cool, man. You know, it's, uh, I just accepted that it's part of it. And before we go on, like, every time you guys were saying, like, the darkness, except I was like, I was just hearing Bane say it, you know. <laughs> the darkness is your ally. I'm like, yeah, it's true. You know, there's a fact to it. But, uh, yeah, the imparcial I, I, I think it's, it will always be there because the more you grow, the more you compare yourself to, to the higher level of artistry or or not even that but like intelligence you know because you, you are growing so every time you feel like an imposter because you're trying something new that it's still that you still haven't figured out you don't compare yourself to something that you already figured out I feel like so you know accepting that you're not the best at everything I think would help first of all and I guess it's yeah, it's, it's yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. It's really, it's it's really, it's really uh, hard to explain. But I feel like you you always look at the 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 hard part of life and you compare that to what you're doing now than the easy part. So of course I feel like an imposter because, for example, for me I'm working with a great team and and, and like I get to meet the Naughty Dog guys. And I'm sitting next to them, and like I'm acting like I'm as good as them, you know. But then I talk to talk to the guys that I look up to, to Eitan Zana, and I'm asking him about it. And he's like, "Yeah, dude, like you know, I'm not that good, man. Like I'm really struggling, man." I'm like, "What the hell, dude? Like you're the guy that I look up to." So, what I figured out that at the end of the day, the artist doesn't define the human, you know. Every human is insecure, but some people are just really good with handling it. Like, with actually, we accept that we are not perfect, and those are the persons who actually grow more. Because you can never be perfect, right? The idea of perfect is, I, I have that as well. Like, f when I see a movie, and, and this is my preference, is like, or, or an image, and when I see like, a, for example, a female or, or like a male character, and, and it's perfect, you know, like the facial structure is perfect, or you see these model on the magazines, I don't get attracted to that because it's like symmetric, it's perfect, and I feel like the imperfect actually brings the perfect up, you know? Like he was talking about, uh, we were talking with Mike about it, about Terminator 2, that movie is not perfect. You can clearly tell some part, like there's this scene where, you know, he's riding on the bike and he falls off to the ground and you can see that it's a double. Yeah, they actually fixed that with the 4K resolution. But, <laughs> yeah, just the FYI. But I don't, I don't care because in the overall image, it's perfect. 
But if you get, st get, get to be picky, then yeah, everything is imperfect. I don't know if I'm like rambling on, but yeah, just accepting that, yeah, you can never be perfect. Or I feel like if, you're, if you feel like you're the perfect version of yourself, of what you have achieved so far, then yeah, you, would, you could be perfect, right? But if you compare yourself to other people, and you will never be satisfied with yourself. So you always think that you're not perfect enough. So we, we have to say enough, right? Because are you perfect enough, not are you imperfect? At least that's how I look at it. Yeah. yeah. It's, so, it's so wild how we're so afraid of failure, yeah. right? Like in, in our society, we talk about failure as if it's this bad word. But when in fact, it's, there's a staircase to success and success is at the top and all the preceding steps are all failure. Yeah. You can't get there without losing a bunch, but we never want to discuss that. We certainly don't want to put it on our social media. You know. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's so important to celebrate your failures and to, to learn from them. Because if you... I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm hogging this thing. Um, failures are the biggest opportunities to uh, learn and to improve and to actually figure out what you're doing. Um, what doesn't work is so much more important than knowing what works because nine out of ten times I'm thinking, oh, that's a happy little accident. How did I get there? You know, that's, you know, that's, it's not, not even fun, but when I, when I fuck up and I do that regularly, I'm like, okay, well, you know, this is a, this is a, this is a sketch. Let's treat this as such. And I know what doesn't work. And then I start over and I do the same thing in half the amount of time and I'm like yes this feels good this feels good and it's all about being brave I think um, so I, I do have the imposter syndrome daily or almost daily um, I think the, what am I doing here you know why am I why am I on the panel with people that have done so many more things than I have ever done but um, and, you know, it's about being brave, about getting out of that comfort zone, giving it your best and just doing something and trying. I'm not doing this for me. Um, I'm having a ball, by the way, but I'm not doing this for me. I hope that our stories will help somebody here in the audience to think like, hey, OK, I can actually send my portfolio to Leica tomorrow. You know, why not try it? The only thing they can say is no. And they could say yes or a maybe or you know, come back next year or improve this or that. Right. So, you know, there's, don't be afraid. And it's, life is so short. And if you're continuously letting fear run you, you'll miss opportunities. And um, it's a shame. It's such a shame. Why, why, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I want to be so old and so, like, so ashamed of all the things I've done. Like, oh. Man, I was, you know, I shouldn't probably have danced on that bar, but I did it and it was fun. You know, that's, you know, don't. I also, I also think the issue is, is if you look at Instagram, is, is when, you, when, when everybody, you know, logs in and, and we look at other people's work, is we're backstage looking at people's showreel. Yeah, exactly. So you think every, that's their life. Well, I know, like, if I see a friend on vacation, I'm like, man, he's living the life. But I know, actually, that that guy is working hard. But I don't, like, I don't accept that, you know? The, the, the idea of a failure is, is if you have, like, Hayao Miyazaki, when he did Nausicaa, it took him 12 years. Akira, it took that guy 12 years. But the, when you say the words 12 years, we can't relate to that because it's just words. But if you think about it, I haven't been doing art for 10 years now, and it's so fucking long in my head. And this dude, the, 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 the span of what I've been doing in art, he was actually working on that project, and it was, still wasn't done. So I think, you know, the, the, everybody who, every artist, every director who's, who you admire, it's just because they accept that they fail, and they do it, f they do it a lot. Like, it's, it's a normal habit for them. That's the only truth, you know? Why somebody's better than you is because he works harder. Every day you don't work on your craft is because the other, every day you don't work on your craft, the other person does. And he's getting better than you. That's the honest truth. You know, it's accept that you're gonna fail. Because if you don't fail, you don't know what you're gonna make a mistake. You know, what the mistake is. At least that's my view. Let's, let's, let's <laughs> <laughs> I kind of under, undermined you while you were talking by giving. 
some expressions. Uh, I actually think that it's really important not to see it as a race at all and not to compare yourself too much. Because if you have that attitude like, oh, when I'm not working, other people are getting better, then you're constantly reminding yourself, like, you know, I need to work today. Maybe you can't, you know. And I also think that, like, there, um, it's really toxic. Uh, well, toxic's maybe a big word. Uh, could be uh, have negative side effects to uh, compare yourself too much to other people. You know what I mean? Like, uh, for me, it's always been a big thing. Um, I've always tried to learn at my own pace, and I always felt bad about it, always guilty, always thinking like, well, I, I used Photoshop 5 until like three years ago, you know, people were like, what is this? This is a dinosaur. Um, but I wasn't ready for the next step, you know? And then when I, I was like, okay, maybe I should catch up. I, I'm, I'm slow, other people uh, are, are keeping up and I'm not. But then in the end, it was okay you know, uh, to learn at my own pace because I'm just trying to do what I do best and what other people are doing is just what, you know. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry to take you down a notch. I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> that's, that's, a legit, that's a legit answer, but I feel, also feel like it's objective because it's like what you want to achieve in your art career and what I want to achieve and what you want to like everybody has their own choices there's not one way and that's how I look at it you know because I feel like I'm the type that if I don't have a motivation or if I don't feel like I put a pedestal for myself I get lazy so that's how I work right and she's right as well it, yeah I feel like I feel like there are two types of artists that I've noticed, right? So you have artists that uh, really need, because I talked about this a lot um, on DeviantArt and on my social media about art block. And you always have two groups. So there's one group that is like, I get into an art block when I get out of my creative flow and I stop drawing. And then a, a challenge like Inktober is what gets them out. And they need to give themselves a kick in the butt and get back into it. And then there are artists that are always pushing themselves a little too much. And they get into an art block because they push themselves past some kind of boundary. And uh, their key to getting out of it would be to slow down and like change their mentality. And I definitely think that it's very personal. It's personal what works. So you're somebody who gets a lot of motivation from being like, all right, you know, I'm gonna get into this, I'm gonna do this, and I need to see what's happening around me as a motivator. And then there's some people who really need to shut themselves off from the world around them. I've noticed that there's these two different types, two totally different approaches to dealing with the, the creative block. So one last thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we were talking about motivation, and I saw, um, I was talking with this about Anthony Jones, and he had a great point, it's like, no, it was Finian actually, and he told me that you shouldn't always uh, uh, count on motivation because, like for me then, in my, in my, in my experience, I can't send a, 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 an a email to my, to my boss and be like, I'm not motivated. So I think what would work is there's this study where they went to prisons, you know, and they were asking these people who had, who were, uh, uh, who had life sentences, and they're like, how do you, you know, maintain this? And they're like, uh, discipline, scheduling, right? First thing you do is you wake up early, you sleep early, and I feel like if you if you actually are disciplined and you don't always just focus on motivation, which that's, you know, that's objectively, that's at least how I think and I'm trying to do. I feel like, because I used to always think about art blocks as well, but now I just see as it in, as in, you know, my, 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 my person, my inner self is telling me, I'm, I'm not in the mood to paint right now. You know, I, I'd much rather have like a three weeks, like a hard burst of art and then a week off than like scattered and you know, like I have three days of art block and whatever. So I try to not think about this art block because the, the, the moment I accept there's a thing as art block, which there is, but for myself, the moment I accept, I'm gonna think about it every time that I'm not doing something. And I used to do that. And, and then I'm gonna break myself off, like apart as a per, you know, mentally. So I'm trying to find ways where I try to push that out of my way and not only, fo only rely on motivation. Yeah. Because I'm pretty sure a guy like James Cameron working at Avatar with like 20,000 people, he's not relying just on motivation. Right. But that's, commi yeah, commitment, exactly, yeah. But that's, that's, that's my view, of course. This is all objective. Objective, yeah. <laughs> There's, a, there's, I'm partly, 
I agree. But motivation, um, when you're working for clients, you have deadlines, you have, uh, you have a responsibility to deliver the work on time because other people are, like, they're waiting for you. You can't, you know, you can't say, ah, you know, I, I felt bad, I had a headache, I drank too much Moscow mules, <laughs> too many, and, you know, life happens. Um, you can't do that when you're working for clients. Um, but sometimes I, I, when I'm working on my, on my own stuff, I, I give myself, cut myself some slack. Now, I'm, I'm not doing Inktober, I'm doing Chilltober, and it, it's going great, I haven't missed a day. <laughs> and uh, next month I'm doing November, so join me. It's saying nope, <laughs> nope. So it's, it's gonna be the, the hashtag of the month. Uh, but in any case, I think that it's very important to find ways to um, motivation. You can, you can actually, I, I found, but I could be so very tired, and then I'll just take my sketchbook, uh, sit on the couch, put on a Marvel movie, I've seen that countless of times, and I'll just, you know, or, or anything really, and I'll just sketch, and whatever comes to mind, like whatever comes to the page is wonderful. And it gives me energy, or I start doing sculpting, and it, it's all art, but it's not with any expectation. So there's no expectation. I don't have to create something that's awesome. I don't have to create something for anybody. I don't, I'm not creating for likes. I don't care about it. Um, and I think that's very important when you're, you're, you're looking for ways to navigate this. So I'm still being creative. Am I making sense? Yeah, yeah. But I'm still creating, I'm still accessing that part of my brain and I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm doing it without having that beast of my, I'm call, I call my demon Phil, because that's my imposter demon and he's my pet and I give him a, a moment of time and I, I pet his, 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 you know, his head and his butt and, you know, and it's like go in the corner and let me do my stuff. Um, and it's acknowledging that, yes, this is it. Phil's there, Phil's a dick, you know, yeah. Phil shut up and now I do my thing and I just, you know, I, I just start doing stuff I like doing, like uh, costuming, uh, I tend to do face paints on myself, which makes for hilarious photographs sometimes, just, you know, do something different. I think it's, it's really interesting that you had said first, be fearless and don't be afraid, but then you also said, but I personify my fear and Phil, and he's over there. And I think it's a, a, really, it's a really cool distinction. What we've, the, the picture we painted here is everyone is unique, right? And everyone's gonna have a path that works for them and what works for some people won't work for others. And I think it's really cool that you're like, hey, be fearless or call your fear Phil. And I think what's, what's the important part about that is that we're all, we're all full of fear. You know, I think, I think it's um, Elizabeth Gilbert who says that fearless lives a short and stupid life. And, and the, the purpose is that, that we're all gonna be afraid. When we all put ourselves out there, it is going to be a daunting process to get to the other side. But if we can call it fill and pet it and put it in the corner and then go through it, I mean, that is the definition of, or that is a definition of a hero. You know, we want them to, despite their fear, go through it. Um, so we're, we're coming into the, the last chapter of this talk here. And what I'd, I'd really like to do is talk about some of the personal things that you all do to take care of yourself. And I think, let's, let's look at, do, do, does anyone here have a morning routine? Something very specific that they, they do in the morning? No. Let me Fashion. think about that. No, we had, okay. Well, is, is, there, is there something specific? Let's, uh, let's, let's leave our audience here on the, the last night of this thing with some actionable things that they can take into their life and, and try. Try a, try a hat on and see if that works for them. Actually, I'm doing what you told me. What are you doing? Well, Last time in Lightbox, you were talking about, and I think you actually should be talking about that because it was really good. Um, your routine in the morning about not t touching your phone, not going on internet, not going on Facebook and Instagram, because that's that's the moment you're just don't don't even just wake up, do your meditation, do do like have breakfast, do some something else, and be ready for the day. And since I heard you talking about that, I was like. I might have to try that, and I'm actually, I'm baby steps, baby steps, but I'm getting there, so I'm, I don't really touch my phone until a certain time in, in the day, and it works, it's, it's liberating. 
it's liberating. So please elaborate on that one because that was really good at Lightbox. Well, thank you. I'm 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 happy. I'm really glad to hear that you're doing that. I'm I'm happy to talk about my personal stuff, but I think I'd I'd really like for y'all to share some of the things that that you guys do. Um, yeah. So then I already got. I think like what what helps for me is just like let's say I'm working on something it doesn't work. Um, I need to get out of. <clears throat> so. I work at home, of course, so uh, like I have my work room and then like my living room is kind of next to each other. I feel like I need to get out of that space because like I, I do believe in kind of some sense, some sense of energy or aura. And if I'm always there, I'm always thinking about it. It doesn't matter if I'm in the other room. So I think like taking a walk without music because I used to do that. But the thing is, is when I do when I put music on, it's like putting more noise in my head. So I'm overthinking stuff. That's my issue. So I'm trying to like actually simplify stuff, you know, like the only thing that I have to worry, worry about right now when I'm walking is not getting hit by a car, you know, and that's super, like, I mean, like, because we're always like, when you, when you work as a professional, you always worry about these super high level stuff that I forget about the simple stuff, you know, I forget about how it is like, for example, about meditation, right, I'm trying to get into that is, it's like when, when, when you're a kid, you know, you, you used to poke into a water, and it doesn't matter why you did it, but you just liked it, right? There's no thinking behind it. If you do it now when you're, a, when you're like an adult, you're like, holy shit, I like, uh, you know, I, I don't have time for this. I have to do this and that, and I have to, you know, like, so what I'm saying is like enjoying the simple stuff in life. I'm trying to kind of get used to that again, you know, as in having a good coffee or just sitting and doing nothing, looking at a tree. <laughs> Literally looking at a tree because I've been doing so much greenery, but you know it's important to kind of balance out the simple stuff with the the, the hectic, you know, like the, the high tension stuff that you do for work. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. Are you gonna? Add no, it? no. Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. I, are, are you I gonna add to yeah. it? Or, or yeah, no, 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 okay. Go, go, go. So to, to to your point, I think you know there's there's this sense of awe when you get into nature, yeah. and there's there's an equation that I love that stress plus rest equals growth. And it's so oftentimes that high achievers have a really hard time with the rest part. Yet there's this idea of your shower hours or your shower thoughts where once you are relaxed is where some of the best ideas come from. And there's endless use cases of the great creators who when they were hit a block would step away and you know, Woody Allen's like, I make an English muffin and I take a shower. Yeah. You know, or, or I go take a walk in the woods, or, you know, or I, you know, Darren Aronofsky's like, I just go to a museum. And I think by, by doing something that takes care of yourself actually is part of the equation of growth, yeah. which for people who you know, have really great track records, often that's the hard part. What were you gonna say, Bastian? I forgot, no, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, no, yeah. Uh, um, I mean, for me, the, uh, in the morning, as I'm working on, on projects and stuff, usually, okay, I, I'm really, I just wake up from the bed and I'm already into the work. So it's, it's bad for me. But in my life, what I want to have the most is the most simple life's pleasure. And I'm really into small rituals, you know. I love to, to have my small coffee and just to, to stay a little bit longer on my uh, balcony or terrace right now and just, as you said, just watching nature. Yeah. But sometimes it's not enough. I have to, yeah, sometimes I just have to take the car and just go, I don't know where, I don't know where, and sometimes I just uh, discover a new place, uh, a small restaurant in a s small French village in south of France, and I'm nobody. I'm nothing else than a strange dude with a smile on his face, like, <laughs> and <laughs> drinking a small coffee. And yeah, just the time kind of stop. Nothing more happen. There is no art. There is nothing. There is just time, wind, people, and simple life's pleasure. It can be, I don't know, for me it's like, <laughs> It's not luxury taste, it's just that I love to, to, to smoke a cigar with my wife. And that's great. It, and she's so badass. I mean, she is a whiskey expert. She loves to drive a motorcycle. She's, like, she's one of the most badass person I know. And I love to, to share those moments with her. 
And I, I hope she's going to be there next year to talk about her imposter syndrome. <coughs> but uh, yeah, we are really into those small moments. And we work very hard in order to kind of buy those moments for us. This is really, really important. Small pleasures of life. It's, it's really important. Mm -hmm. That's my love. Yeah. <laughs> Thoughts over here? Yeah. I mean, I definitely agree with nature, taking a walk outside, looking at trees, uh, cooking and that kind of stuff. But I suppose uh, for me, I, what, I, what, I, what I like is I, I, I need to recognize when I'm going to feel low. And, and I need to, because I did have depression once, I kind of take it as a positive now because I know when those, when those times are coming, when the kind of black dog is descending. Um, so I know, so like for example, um, even like a, a full inbox can like set me off for a day or if somebody barges me at the train station, it can upset me for hours and I think, why is this? So then I take a step back, I go for a walk, I cook a meal and, and I try and look after myself. It's, so it's, it's not just doing those things, it's recognising when you should. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about like things that we do to prevent. All right, so I have two really specific things. I have like a little app on my computer, a program called WorkRave that forces me to take micro breaks. And it like pops up and I set it up so that if I try to click it away, it makes me wait even longer. <laughs> and I'm like, stop, but I have to wait. And then in those couple of seconds that I take a break, I realize that I'm like hyper focusing, too stressed out and that kind of thing. And the second thing that I do is like, I notice that people really try to seek out value in their life and try to curate their life a lot. They like try to listen to the best bands, they try to watch the best movies, you know, it's all part of like trying to keep living the best life. So I give up completely on that and I watch a lot of trash TV. <laughs> that helps me a lot. For the Dutchies out there, I'm a big fan of the Rijdende Rechter. <laughs> I love just not thinking about my art and just looking at people arguing about how the fence between their gardens, you know, it just takes me out of my own stress. So, <laughs> Those are two very specific tips. And maybe you have something about I, I'm terrible with routines. I, I have no, no functional advice at all. If, I'd be a more practical human being if I had any advice on that area. Um, I, I would love to have the self-discipline to develop a routine, but I just get lost in daydreams from the moment I wake up. It's a miracle if I get up. It's like, <laughs> I, yeah, until I've had a coffee, I'm not even active. I'm just daydreaming. Um, yeah, just drink coffee. Drink coffee, guys. Yeah, there we go. That's my tip. <laughs> um, so awesome to hear such a varied group of thoughts. Um, do we have two minutes? We're, we have two minutes. Um, I'll, I'll break it down quickly for, for, for y'all what I do, um, because the goddess asked. Um, we, we, she demanded. Um, we talked about this in our talk this morning, so I won't go too, too in depth, but I'm, I'm glad it was of value to you. Um, the thought process behind having a routine or standardizing your operating procedures is to remove the decisions that don't change your life. And there's, you know, cognitive load is a real thing. You only have the ability to make so many crucial decisions in a day. And so if you're spending time thinking about what you're going to wear or what you're going to eat for breakfast, you are spending your decision-making currency before it comes time to make the decisions that count. So what I try to do in the morning is very specifically um, roll out of bed and make my bed. There's tons of really great science on why starting your day with an accomplishment um, pays dividends going forward. And then I drink two glasses of water because hydration is happiness for me and I'm finding that I'm uh, dehydrating myself with every exhale. Um, and I'm going to, yeah, no, I'm, and, and I'm in, this is, this is, this is hyper specific. And, and I'm, and I'm, I drink a glass of water in between each of these next steps too. Um, because I mean, try it, try it. I, did, I didn't, I didn't come up with hydration as happiness. Um, <laughs> We're going to wrap it up here. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, <laughs> um, and a huge thank you to Mike and Loesch and Claire and Bastion and the goddess and Dinar and to Firestarter Magazine and Spirit It On. Um, now, 
Being that this is the final event of Playgrounds Netherlands 2019, I'd like to do one last thing together. If you have a drink, would you put it down? And could we collectively do one clap together? Okay, so on the count of three, we'll all do one clap together, and then we can all go about our merry way. I believe the bar is, is open, this party goes on. Um, I know everyone up here, myself included, want to talk to you guys. We are here to be of value to you. Um, so please come up and hang out with us. Um, my name is Banks, um, and on the count of three, we're gonna finish this thing together. One, two, three. Awesome, you guys, thank you, have a wonderful night.